Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Tom Harley and I'm chairman of the Menzies Research Centre. Uh, let me welcome you here to the second John Howard Lecture to be given by the Right Honourable Ian Duncan Smith, uh, the United Kingdom Secretary of State for Work and Pensions. I'll formally introduce our lecturer and John Howard, the man at honours, in a moment. But first let me acknowledge some of the many other distinguished guests present here this evening. The Attorney General for New South Wales, Greg Smith. The Shadow Minister for Family and Community Services, Kevin Andrews. The Shadow Cabinet Secretary, Philip Ruddock. John Alexander, John Howard's successor but one as member for Bennelong. <laughs> um, State MPs, Peter Phelps, Andrew Rowan and Catherine Cusack. And my apologies if I've missed anyone. Uh, the former Foreign Minister and former Liberal Party leader and my co-Federal Vice President of the Liberal Party, Alexander Downer. Um, Robin Nolan, the chair, chair of the Liberal Women's Council. Uh, some other former MPs, John Stone, Chris Miles, Bill Stefaniak, Patricia Forsyth and Michael Armitage. My fellow directors of the Menzies Research Centre, Arthur Sinodinus, who is the newly minted state president of the Liberal Party of New South Wales. Good luck, Arthur. <laughs> um, um, Tony McClellan, Paul Espy, and Michael Osborne. Uh, and Julian Lisa, uh, who is the executive director of the Menzies Research Centre, whose inspiration and energy know no bounds. Julian does the work, we the directors merely try and keep up. In addition to those mentioned tonight, the Centre is honoured by the presence of some other distinguished uh, members of the audience. Professor Peter Shergold, former Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet under John Howard, and the former of the Chairman of the ABC, Donald MacDonald. Welcome everyone. We're delighted when, we were delighted when John Howard agreed to the Menzies Research Centre naming the lecture in his honour. And we were del doubly delighted to have him deliver the first lecture in Melbourne. It's entirely appropriate that this lecture bears his name, as each lecture seeks to provide an original intellectual contribution to an important matter of public policy. On each occasion, the lecture will be held in a different state so that people from all over the nation might participate in the debates which the, it's the aim of these lectures to foster. John Howard's government was a reformist activist government founded on strongly held liberal principles. When John appeared on Insiders a week or so ago, a number of people, some of them Labour, said to me how refreshing it was to be reminded of what a Prime Minister should be like. It was a measured discussion of public policy founded on principle. Let me thank John Howard for his patronage, his enthusiasm and his involvement in helping to select Ian Duncan Smith to deliver this lecture. We believe the John Howard Lecture is well on its way to becoming an important event in the intellectual life of Australia. Before I introduce our guest speaker, let me give you an overview of the Centre's current work program. This year, the, the Centre has been commissioned by Tony Abbott to stage a series of round tables to stimulate the policy development process. We engage people from outside the party with, our, with uh, policy experts with the parliamentarians. So far, we've, attack, we've tackled productivity, labour market participation, economics, demography, science and technology. Items on our forward agenda include a roundtable in Melbourne on tax reform. We're going to have a real tax summit, uh, not a, a faux one like the Labour Party. A roundtable in Sydney on energy reform, including a visit to Lucas Heights. Uh, the Centre will also be announcing the establishment of a small business red table reduction task force. The Centre's potential is only limited by its ability to attract sponsorship. If you're interested in supporting the Centre's activities, there's some information on your seat about how you can do that. I'd encourage you to support an organisation that has made and will continue to make a substantial contribution to the policy debate in this country. And please see us, Julian myself or any of our directors afterwards uh, if we can answer any questions on the Centre's program. For those watching at home and we're being webcast, uh, you can visit our website on www.mrcltd.org.au. Tonight, Ian Duncan-Smith will be speaking to us 
on welfare reform, investing in life change. Ian was educated at Dunchurch College of Management, the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst, Universita per Stranieri in Perugia, and HMS Conwy in Anglesey. As part of the Scots Guards, Ian saw active service in Northern Ireland and what is now Zimbabwe, and also served in Canada and Germany. Ian later worked for GEC, GEC Marconi, a defence company, Bell Winch, a property company, and he's also been on the board of Jane's Information Group, a publishing company. He was elected as Member of Parliament for Chingford in 1992, a seat that was in part once held by Winston Churchill. After service in the Shadow Cabinet and following the 2001 election, Ian was elected leader of the Conservative Party during what was a very difficult time in the party's history. In 2003, he lost the leadership. Ian saw this defeat as an opportunity. As party leader, he had met many disadvantaged Britons and was keen to ensure that he did something to address the promises he had made to fix the broken society. So he established the Centre for Social Justice, a policy think tank. He sought to bring new, small, voluntary and charitable service providers into conservative policy making. First, he created a series of networks of the charitable service providers, so each of them could meet each other, share stories and provide the party policy makers with anecdotal evidence of the problems they faced. Partly as a result of this work, and just like under the Howard government here in Australia, the Cameron government in the UK has resourced the voluntary and non-government sector as major providers of welfare support. Secondly, the centre tried to gauge the views of welfare, welfare recipients in their work by talking to individual recipients and polling them about their views. And third, they set their researchers, sent their researchers overseas to see, how, see programs that worked. The centre produced two major publications as part of this process. The first, entitled Breakdown Britain, identified the problems Britain faced. The second, Breakthrough Britain, contains 192 individual policy suggestions on how to make Britain work again. They're on the web, they're very easily accessible, and I commend them to all of you. I look at this and see as it as a true blueprint for social policy work, engaging the real community, working with non-government and government service providers, and testing and evaluating real evidence, and coming out with well-founded, implementable, practical policies. It is and should be inspirational for Liberals. In the end, policy was developed by consulting directly with social entrepreneurs and their clients, people who'd never participated in the policy-making process of a non-Labour party had genuine input leading to better policy, welfare policies that were not aimed at assuaging the claims of the welfare lobby, but directed at the social ills welfare policy purports to address. Following the 2010 election, he was made Secretary of State for Work and Pensions uh, and is one of the standout successes of the Cameron government. He was named Minister of the Year by the House of Commons magazine for his implementation of the government oh. welfare reforms. It's my great pleasure and enormous privilege to invite Ian Duncan Smith to deliver the second Howard oration. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for that uh, very kind introduction. I must say, uh, coming to Australia is no hardship, uh, although I must say that uh, had England not been so inept as to win the Ashes, it would be a lot easier, I suspect, so my apologies on that. Uh, <laughs> well, it was a long time of coming, so <laughs> you'll have to forgive me. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to say here that it is a huge privilege to be here today uh, to give this lecture, and I want to come to the reasons for that in a second. But uh, I want, first of all, to impress really here, I suppose, on the importance on conservatism and social justice, particularly in relation to recent developments in the UK. Uh, but first, let me say from afar, and this is absolutely true, I've long admired the Menzies Research Centre. Your work in uh, public uh, policy uh, reform has changed national debates, and you were building, I think, a really honourable legacy uh, to Sir Robert Menzies. Centre-right think tanks like this one 
and the Centre for Social Justice, which uh, I set up in London, have an integral role, I think, to play in refining out conservative approaches in, in opposition and then in government. But I'm particularly pleased to give this lecture here today in Sydney, uh, the John Howard Lecture. John uh, uh, is a, a real friend, uh, both personal and also a phenomenal friend uh, to the Conservative Party uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, it's, I wasn't expecting that, but I, it is true. He is uh, a real friend to us. Uh, many of you will understand that uh, his work as leader of the Liberal Party and Prime Minister was, uh, from our standpoint back in the UK, notwithstanding any views that you hold here, which I accept to be the same, uh, was absolutely exceptional. In rousing Australia's battlers, he frankly connected uh, with something very powerful indeed, probably not uh, nothing as powerful since uh, Mrs. Thatcher's idea uh, of uh, how you connect with those who never voted Conservative in the past. Really, really powerful. And it led the way, I believe, to an incredibly strong and fine reforming government. And just like Lady Thatcher, uh, I think uh, John has a really exceptional clarity of vision. As Prime Minister, I think you knew exactly where you wanted to take the country. And this, I know, enabled you to lead for so long. And also on a personal note, as I said earlier on, you know, the Conservative Party spent some time in the doldrums uh, in, uh, in the United Kingdom, in case you hadn't noticed. Uh, and uh, so really on a personal note from the party's standpoint, I really want to thank you, John, for all the time that you came over. And many, of course, of your ministers, a number in the uh, room tonight, uh, led, I believe, by you to uh, offer support and advice uh, and help when things were looking pretty low. Uh, for a party in opposition. And I personally want to thank you uh, because I recall the guidance you gave me immediately after I had stepped down as Conservative Party leader, voluntarily of course, uh, when, uh, <laughs> when you urged me really to continue pursuing the ideas that I had been trying to push uh, while I was leader of the opposition. Uh, so I thank you personally for that. We thank you as Conservatives in the United Kingdom. And I think, frankly, as far as all of those who are Conservatives generally, uh, I thank you for being one of the outstanding Conservative leaders uh, of the post-war period. <laughs> but it was really during my time as Conservative leader that I began to turn uh, the party's attention to people who I felt had left, been left behind, really, by society and governments. And despite then being the world's fourth largest economy, Britain was constrained by some very deep social problems. Educational inequality was, and I think today still remains, a scar on our society. Our poorest children were being failed by the institutions designed to give them a future. Crime was high, and the fear of crime higher still. People lived in growing uncertainty as they walked the streets and then to get on with their lives, particularly in deprived neighborhoods. We often forget, because the fear of crime seems highest amongst the middle classes, that in truth it is on the estates uh, that the greatest level of crime takes place. An OECD report looked at our children's well-being and found the UK in pretty poor shape. And too many social housing estates had become no-go areas for police officers, but rich hunting grounds for drug dealers, street gang recruiters, and violent moneylenders. Street gangs in Britain, it seems almost impossible to think of. And it seemed obvious to me that those on the centre-right had a responsibility to enter the debates and help to find the solutions uh, to these problems. You see, for too long, uh, I reached the conclusion, for too long, conservatives had left this area to the left, only occasionally making forays simply though often to attack spending on welfare, and everything was viewed through the lens of saving money or catching scroungers, or should I say here, bludgers. And yet, whilst this might encourage the dyed-in-the-wool conservative supporter, I think it remained a wholly negative message and allowed the left to characterize conservatives as simply interested in cutting benefits, nothing more. And the more I looked at this, the more I believed that this caricature needed to be changed for the history of the Conservative Party in the UK has always been one of major social reform, a proud history. What else would you expect from the party of Wilberforce, Shaftesbury, Disraeli and Churchill? We need no lessons from the left on how to improve the quality of life of British people. So Conservatives have every right and motivation to have concerns about the social fabric 
of our nation. I think it is in our DNA as conservatives, and I think that across all uh, uh, of our communities, including in this country. It is in our DNA to believe instinctively in aspiration and mobility. Why then wouldn't we, when we look at these large numbers of people trapped in dependency, want to change that to help them improve the quality of their lives and those of their children as well? The left's narrow measurement for social concern rests on the amount of money spent, always the amount of money spent. It shouldn't be a conservative obligation. It should be one to change that test and what money is spent on rather than the amount that is spent and importantly, what life change that that money brings. So there is a conservative philosophical reason to be focused on poverty, a clear historical and general idea. But there is, as ever, another good reason. Such problems demand our attention for very sound economic reasons. The cost of such social failure drives high and rising public expenditure. In the last decade or so, uh, working age welfare expenditure in my country has increased by some 50%, and that during a period of growth. Over a similar period, uh, police expenditure had risen by some 50% in real terms, and spending on prisons by a third. Britain has been spending more and more money trying to tackle the effects of poverty through a growing state, yet the outcomes are very poor. So for conservatives who believe in a healthy economy, it is also not enough to simply dismiss poverty as someone else's problem, or even a problem for those on the left of politics to deal with. Even in the rhetoric of the debates, I feel many have become paralyzed, lost, or in some cases even just given up altogether. Consider the very concept of social justice. I recall people in the Conservative Party having maddening Hayekian debates about the idea of social justice was a contradiction as social was collective and justice was individual. I remember these debates endlessly. Conservatives love nothing more than a good argument about the real meaning of words. But these terminological arguments were utterly detached from the British people's understanding and they marginalize conservatives even further in the eyes of the electorate. We asked, when I was at the Center for Social Justice, through a series of polls, what the term social justice actually meant to the public. Interestingly, they had a much more generalized and clearer idea than we understood of what this phrase meant. They rejected the notion, absolutely outright, that it meant a bigger state or increased spending on welfare. Instead, they chose and felt that it meant support for people in real need and support for those who were helping them in their difficulty. In other words, in a very conservative way, it spoke of decency, not socialism. A and this helped me to point out to my colleagues that when we spent so much effort publicly disavowing that term, it simply left us appearing as uncaring and even crass in the eyes of those who hadn't made their minds up. The result of all of this <coughs> is that we have, I think, too readily ceded this area to the left, who have for too long set the terms of the debate and correspondingly willed the means. The consequences in my country are all too obvious now for us to see. Thirteen years of labor rule demonstrated how the left's approach is grounded in a very narrow understanding of what poverty is and how it can be solved. Policymakers became fixated with levels of income rather than asking why people were actually living in poverty. A poverty line became the benchmark by which all policy had to be measured. Yet in reality, this line told us nothing about the causes of the problem. According to this approach, poverty was simply about a lack of money. And so the solution they pursued became income transfers through benefit payment increases, tax credits, and a growing welfare system. Worse still, this fueled a short-term political approach to government. For by measuring poverty in such an arbitrary way, politicians could tweak welfare payments to increase income for narrow groups 
and apparently lifts some people out of poverty almost magically. Superficial headline victories were hailed with a wave of a pen or a catchy ministerial initiative announcement. But a few extra pounds in the pocket didn't actually change people's lives or give them any extra opportunity. Does anyone honestly believe that increasing a family's welfare payment slightly will mean that their children are more likely to form stable and healthy relationships, achieve at school, or find a job when they become an adult? Imagine for a moment, just imagine, an alcoholic mother living with two young daughters. Would those children's lives change by giving their mother just a bit more money? You'll change nothing for those children unless you also transform their mother's life. And the inadequacy of the previous UK government's approach was then borne out by some pretty revealing statistics. More than 150 billion pounds has been spent on a system of targeted tax credits since 2003, in many cases with the aim of pushing families with children just above the poverty line. It's what I call often the pound poverty line. One pound below, you're poor. One pound above, you're not poor. But progress was obviously very weak at best. And by the time Labour left office, income inequality in the UK has reached record levels at a worse level than at any time in my lifetime. And perhaps worse, the poorest groups in society actually went backwards during that period. So we should be clear. Income matters, but the root causes of poverty and the source of income matter much more. Dealing with the root causes of poverty rather than its assumptions was the reason I established the CSJ, which was an independent think tank. From the outset, I spent a great deal of time in the UK's most disadvantaged neighbourhoods, asking questions and seeking to understand what life was like in those seemingly forgotten places. In the unseen chaos of dysfunctional homes and schools, I met a section of British society that had been completely left behind. I saw the poor health care, the discarded needles on vandalized playgrounds, the boarded windows and broken streetlights. Crime terrified families. But I also saw many people who lived on these estates. Almost everything these people knew and experienced suggested government and society had pretty much given up on them. Yet in my heart, many of these communities were also being steered uh, by key voluntary community groups led by inspiring people that I saw. They held the secret of what leads people into poverty. It was that knowledge that shaped our definition subsequently of the definition of what that meant. And we came up with five pathways to poverty. Family breakdown, educational failure, severe personal debt, drug and alcohol addiction, and welfare dependency often characterized by intergenerational worklessness. Now, they are interconnected, all of those pathways, and move from generation to generation. A child who experiences family breakdown is more likely uh, to fail at school. A child who fails at school is less likely to find employment and more likely to, to be dependent on benefits. And debt is one of the main causes of family breakdown for a person on benefits <clears throat> living on very low income is more likely to be in debt. Those who shaped the definition of the pathways to poverty were working in communities that the state simply failed to reach. They are the ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Where the state has no answers, I think of courageous rehabilitation pioneers taking the most damaged heroin addicts into full recovery. I think of the unique residential charity fostering entire families and saving children from the black hole of Britain's care system. And the youth worker offering violent gang members a way out of their entrapment. These people and countless others like them are saving and transforming the lives of those cut adrift and forgotten. And by their success, they prove beyond any doubt at all that beating poverty is about changing lives, not just giving people more money. 
and by seizing their second chance, those they had helped showed that most people will do the right thing if given an opportunity. And this gets to the heart of why conservatives should embrace social justice. Instinctively, we understand that it is better to trust people because generally they do the right thing by themselves and their families when they have that opportunity. In this, I believe society is governed by a dynamic of collective self-interest. As we grow, our horizons and values are shaped by education, relationships, and community. In this natural process, as we develop from being single to being engaged in relationships, we move from self-interest to collective self-interest, a natural process. The point is that social policy has to grasp this if it is to succeed. Yet the potential of people to change their outcomes is something I think that the left has too often rejected. Too many such governments have sought to remove that freedom, seeing the poorest like children in need of direction, and in so doing, extending their dependency on the state by degrees. Now, during my last year, my role in the government of the United Kingdom has brought me face to face with the legacy of static public policy. Before entering government, my work at the CSJ had identified welfare dependency and worklessness as the epicenter of much of the poverty that blighted the UK. Without meaningful and stable employment, or the prospect of it, lives can uh, lack purpose. Children born into a culture of worklessness, who sometimes grow up not seeing anyone leave for work in the morning, not just in their own home, but even within the community, often repeat the patterns of their parents as set out for them. Getting somebody into work can dramatically change their life, family, and circumstances. But in May 2010, when I became Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, I inherited a broken welfare system. Now, my budget, by the way, is just under £160 billion a year. Uh, and if you include the other bits of benefits held by the Chancellor, which will eventually join it, it's knocking on the door of £200 billion a year. A system to run it that was so dysfunctional and perverse that poverty had become the only possibility for many caught up in it. It was absurdly complex, with more than 30 separate types of benefits, governed by a maze of rules, regulations, and disincentives. Officials and claimants were equally bemused by it, and I really do mean officials as well. For too many benefit claimants, choosing to take up work was seen as a very poor choice. This is because someone moving into part-time work would find they could end up losing even as much as 95% of what they earned. That was due to the high tax rates and punitive levels of benefit withdrawal uh, almost immediately. And the result became an inflexible system which no longer encourages someone to seek work. Today, the benefit system must recognize that the decision to take work for the majority of people is fundamentally a practical one. The efforts you make in finding employment should be financially rewarding, yet the British welfare system assumes that the poorest people would take work even when it clearly didn't pay. And I suspect none of us here tonight would work for a 90% tax rate especially if we could earn reasonably more money for no effort at all. That is what the system does in the United Kingdom. And this has resulted in intergenerational worklessness becoming a logical choice for far too many in Britain. Despite record economic growth in the UK economy, 63 successive quarters of it, some 4.5 million people of working age were living on out-of-work benefits before the recession struck, and now over one million have been out of work on benefits for more than 10 years. And most inexcusable of all, almost two million UK children live in households where no one works at all. In parallel with the lack of financial incentives to take work, there was poorly targeted help for those who were expected to look for work. Welfare to work schemes were too often measured by process and outputs, such as the number of people entering and completing programs rather than outcomes, such as whether job seekers were entering and staying in work. Support tended to be state-run, clunky and impersonal. And all this meant we were failing those in the system, not to mention the taxpayers 
whose money was poured in to prop this up. Yet after a year in government, I believe we may be beginning to start that process of change. And I want to just say a few words tonight, if I can, very quickly, about what we're trying to do. Uh, at the heart of all of our change is a big change to the benefit called universal credit, which is a single integrated uh, welfare payment, which will replace a number of benefits and tax credits. Not only will this be simpler for claimants to navigate, it will also be designed to make work pay at any number of hours, and I stress any number of hours. Claimants will have a disregard, the amount of money they will be allowed to earn before their benefits are withdrawn, and then a taper rate, which determines the rate at which universal credit is withdrawn as they increase their hours of work. This taper rate for us at the moment will be set at 65% for every claimant for every hour of work. No overlapping tapers, no cliff edges, just clear incentives to move into work and to move on up in through work. And we anticipate that the move to universal credit is most likely to move almost one million people out of poverty. And critically, the gains from the change will overwhelmingly accrue to those in the bottom half of the income distribution. And all this is before any dynamic effect of the universal credit cuts in, that is to say, the push and incentivizing of people back to work. So getting the incentives right is absolutely vital, but we also have to get people ready for work and have been out of work for some time. This isn't about uh, skilling them up with some government-inspired skills program, but about building their confidence, helping them to present themselves to sell themselves. And that's what our work program now launched is going to do. And here I have to thank you, because I must confess that in developing this program, I've taken a great deal of interest in Australia's welfare to work schemes, John. Now, I was especially keen to learn from your pioneering transition launched by the last Liberal government in 1998 of state-run employment services to voluntary and private sector provision to the Jobs Network and now Job Service Australia, and I was looking at some today. As a country, Britain has taken too long to understand the basic message that we shouldn't be so concerned with who delivers support or how to do it, but whether or not they actually do something that works. And we should be relentlessly focused on outcomes, a very conservative concept, and that's what the work program is all about. So we're contracting with the best of the public, private, and voluntary sectors, paying them almost entirely on results that they achieve in getting people into work, and then keeping them there. And I stress keeping them there, mentoring them. It's a single program, but as in Australia, we're going to use the system of differential pricing to make sure there's some support for the hardest to help. So if you help someone who spent 10 years on sickness and disability benefits to find a job, you'll get a much higher payment than if you help a typical job seeker. And keeping them in work for two years, and you'll get the biggest payout of all. This is hugely aimed at the voluntary sector, <coughs> gearing up to get those who really know back into the game of getting people back to work. And underscoring all of this will be a system of sanctions, a new system of sanctions regime, should someone refuse to cooperate. If they work with us, we will help to get the claimant into work, but refuse, and they will lose benefit. I think this is really very simple and fair. I see it as part of a contract, a contract with the British taxpayer, who is also part of this process, and is they who are actually paying for it, lest we ever forget that. But there's another area, disability. A third change that we have to make if we're going to enable all households to benefit from work. We have to reform our system of support for those groups that have been written off on inactive benefits for too long, particularly many disabled people. I know this is a sensitive area, uh, but we do need now uh, to reform and change this. So this is part of the reason why the demand for our main disability benefit has actually risen in the UK by 40% for children alone. And we know that there are many disabled people who can work and want to do so. And it is completely unacceptable to leave them written off on benefits, categorized as they are. And that is why I'm going to move to a model that is about asking what people can do rather than focusing on what they can't, with regular objective assessments of everyone, and I stress everyone, on incapacity benefits to assess changing conditions. Those who are ready and able to work to be moved on to Job Seekers Allowance and a system of unemployment benefits. 
those with sickness or disability that affects their ability to work will be moved on to a more supportive benefit, the Employment and Support Alliance. Where their condition makes it difficult even to take steps towards work, they will receive unconditional support at the highest rate. We are taking a similar approach to Disability Living Alliance. And the important thing here is making sure that those who receive the benefit get the best kind of support possible, but where they need to be moving to work, then they move to work as quickly as possible. And we're taking the same approach to lone parents. Very simply, in the past, little distinction was made between those who had real genuine caring responsibilities that precluded them from any work and those who were able to work even within certain parameters. I remind you all here, you may not have been aware of this, that prior to November 2008, lone parents in the UK could claim inactive benefits, known as income support, until the youngest child was 16. Now, as a result of the changes, we're going to make it will be reduced to five. Every household that can work should have work and should seek work. This is a welfare reform package which has its roots in conservatism. It's about trusting people and giving them a chance to build their futures. But there's one area before I conclude that I really do think is vitally important for all of us in Western society. It brings me to the most important issue I think facing us, that of the growing levels of family breakdown. Family breakdown in the UK is at historically high levels. For too long, policymakers have ignored the effect of dysfunctional family formation on the character of communities and the future prospects of the children condemned to grow up in them. During my time at the Centre for Social Justice, I determined that it was the role of government that we did what we could to change the scale of the levels of family breakdown that we now experience. Gone are the days that the government could simply not care. What is vital is to ensure that government creates a level playing field for people as they form families, which it does not now. One of the favoured attacks of the establishment left is that to do anything in this area is to unfairly favour married families. They are wrong. Yet what we have witnessed over the last decade or more is not a neutrality in government policy towards family formations, particularly marriage, but what in effect amounts to an assault on the whole idea of marriage and long-term commitment in family life. And whilst I accept that the state has no business lecturing people how to live their lives, it does though have a duty to at least be fair to those who choose to make the sacrifices so that their children can be brought up in a stable and loving home. I am someone who believes in following the evidence and the work of the CSJ shows what happens to children's outcomes when families break down. Armed with the evidence, we need to do much, much more to help people stabilize and form their relationships. It's clear that people respond to incentives and disincentives. And currently in the UK, there is a damaging financial discouragement to couple formation, known as the couple penalty, uh, despite its stable outcomes for children. That is why I intend that our welfare reforms make an impact on the couple penalty where it matters most amongst the families on the lowest incomes at least. Alongside that, the Prime Minister has now made it absolutely clear that we will, in this Parliament, re-recognise marriage in the tax system, and that's a very good start. I don't come here, with respect, to give advice or lecture any of you here about strategy, and nor do you even need me to do so. You have an impressive legacy as a party, and you were led, as I said earlier, exceptionally uh, by one of the great conservatives of modern times. But I do say that the message on welfare reform, and if there's one message I hope to be able to give you, should be more than just a story about cuts. It must be a positive narrative, as I have outlined, a life-changing message, as conservatives have never been more necessary to enter this field. <laughs> Several years ago, there was a deep need for change in Britain's Conservative Party. We had suffered major election defeats and I think had become a little out of touch. As leader, I began a process of thinking anew about social reform and the need to reconnect with the aspirations of British people, no matter where they lived, no matter what their income was. Particularly those, it seemed to me, who had been let down by a failed government. And through the work of the Centre for Social Justice, a tired debate about poverty and social justice has been radically, I hope, reinvigorated. Instead of a stilted and often shallow debate 
about cuts versus spending. The real debate now centers on the question of how reform can achieve life transformation. But isn't that what conservatives have always been about? Helping people to take control of their lives and strive to meet their aspirations. An optimistic message of a society where no one is discarded and no one is left behind. Now that's surely a true conservative message. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tom. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's with a personal pleasure as well as a political pleasure uh, that I uh, move a vote of thanks uh, to Ian and to um, acclaim uh, a speech uh, that touched every base that is important to we in this room and to millions of Australians. Uh, his philosophy about social welfare, social justice, uh, whatever description you want to use, we know what he's talking about. His philosophy has um, uh, all of the underpinnings that are necessary to bring about the right in outcome. It's driven by a moral purpose. Whether you call yourself a conservative or a liberal or in the United States a republican or whatever, uh, one of the great injunctions that we uh, should live by is that we should strive to have outcomes in our society that are good for the nation, good for individuals and good for families. Uh, the other great underpinning, of course, is the principle of incentive. Um, we all know how important incentives are. Changing behaviour uh, comprises a lot more than adding pounds or dollars to people's income. And what Ian has demonstrated in his um, life in politics, uh, particularly in the period immediately before the change of government, uh, has been a willingness to tackle a problem that has beset all of our societies and for which nobody has uh, as yet a comprehensive answer. But he's tackled it in a very courageous way. He's accepted that nobody has had a monopoly of wisdom. Uh, we haven't here in the Liberal Party in Australia and neither has the Conservative Party in the United Kingdom. And as still a political warrior as I am, although less active now than I used to be, um, I admired the fact that he enjoined all of us not to surrender ownership of this area, philosophically, morally or politically, to the left. He calls them, with that endearing expression, the, the left establishment. That's sort of, you know, translated into Australian terms. That's a bit like the inner urban elite. But um, um, it has, um, uh, you know, it, it has, a, has a certain resonance. I think we, we know the group we're talking about. <laughs> you know, and, you know, anything goes as far as arrangements are concerned. And don't you dare suggest that one particular type of arrangement produces, on average, better outcomes than some other arrangement. The reality is that we, we know from our own experience in life, we know from our own experience as a nation, that just as individual incentive drives productivity and wealth and good outcomes business-wise and economically, uh, the existence in our community of strong, stable families, many of them break up, of course they do, but that doesn't rob them uh, of their virtue and their value. Now, the fact that many robberies go undetected and unpunished doesn't mean that we should change the Crimes Act of New South Wales uh, to uh, uh, sanction uh, robbery uh, at will. Uh, we know the value of stable families and we know that when a society denigrates the value of stable families, it's a society uh, that is well down the path to decline uh, and perhaps even ruin. On a more personal note, can I express to Ian my admiration for the great courage he displayed as opposition leader uh, in uh, Great Britain early in 2003, when he was one of the few very prominent voices in the Western world. There's another one in this room, Alexander Downer, uh, who uh, was prepared to support the entirely justifiable military operation against Saddam Hussein in Iraq. And uh, he gave bipartisan support, I think it at various stages of the debates in the House of Commons if it hadn't been for the leadership that Ian displayed, 
uh, the uh, support that the Labor government had given under Tony Blair uh, could well have lost its, its parliamentary support. So he displayed enormous courage. And uh, I admired very much on a personal note the tremendous um, uh, commitment he then gave after the inevitable disappointment of, of uh, losing the leadership of the Conservative Party. Uh, he hurled himself into uh, policy work, policy renewal, and as a result of that, I've heard tonight the best and most incisive blueprint uh, to an understanding of this problem that I've heard from anybody for many, many years. He, he has actually thought about the problem and he's, he's challenged some of the assumptions. Uh, we did some good things in government, of course we did, but we didn't get all of the answers. And uh, I think it's, it's one of the things that challenges all of us. Uh, and uh, I thought that as he spoke of the value of local communities, the value of non-government organisations. I was reminded of that wonderful phrase of Edmund Burke's about marshalling the little platoons in our societies, the small volunteer groups, many of them based uh, on churches, not all of them, but many of them based on churches that have done tremendous work and continue to do tremendous work. And I often used to say, when, particularly when we launched the Job Network, that when it, when it came to appreciating what it was like at the coalface uh, of poverty and underprivileged in Australia, and we have plenty of it, uh, we did then and we still do now, nobody understood what was at stake than, I use the metaphor of a Salvation Army officer, uh, who understood what it was like for a family to be in generations of poverty and who understood better than anybody how hard it was to raise the welfare dollar. So Ian, you have done great justice to yourself tonight. Um, we admire the, the work of the new Conservative government in the United Kingdom. It's wonderful to have a Conservative in Downing Street again. I mean, I maintain very civil and good relations with the Labor government in uh, Britain for 11 long years. Uh, we had 13 months of a Conservative government and a Liberal government in Australia and then 11 years on the other side and uh, it was great to see David Cameron back in office. And uh, we maintained our links with the Conservative Party, as indeed your party did with us when we were in opposition. It's been one of the quirky things about Australian and British politics in the last 25 years that for, the, for a long period of time we had a Liberal government here and a Labor government uh, in... Uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, the other way around, with a Labor government here and a Conservative government in Britain, and then it was reversed. But, Ian, thank you for coming um, uh, all this way. Uh, and uh, uh, British ministers, in be, indeed British leaders and British people are always welcome in our country. Uh, the bonds between Australia and the United Kingdom are ageless, they're historic, they're unbreakable, and they're very important because we share common values and a common culture and a, a view of society but what you've touched on tonight is a challenge for all societies. It's not just a challenge for Australia and Britain, it's a challenge for the United States, it's a challenge for the societies of Europe, and it's a challenge for nations all around the world. But you've brought moral clarity, uh, intellectual vigour, and principles based on what we hold dear as parties to the task, and we acclaim you and congratulate you, and thank you for that. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Julian Lisa. I'm the Executive Director of the Menzies Research Centre, and it falls to me to close this evening after we've heard two extraordinary speeches from two extraordinary men of the centre-right. I think they are two men who have an enormous amount in common. I think, firstly, they are both men of huge character who went through the vicissitudes of political life and demonstrated that character from what they did when they didn't suffer good when they didn't enjoy good times but rather when they suffered defeat and the way in which they both rebounded from that experience is i think a great demonstration of their political character the second thing and i've learnt this most recently when my board very kindly sent me to look at policy development in the anglosphere that both men have an enormous international reputation uh, people in Canada, in, in Britain, in America, in New Zealand, even in remote places, know of John Howard and know of his government. And people in those places also know of the welfare reforms 
that Ian Duncan Smith has engaged in in Britain at the moment. And we in Australia are watching in particular the work around the universal credit and the work that he's doing in relation to disability reform. Fourthly and finally, they are men who know very importantly that it is vital that people on the centre-right get involved in the debates about welfare reform. And it's vital because we on the centre-right think that individual dignity is what it's all about. And frankly, welfare dependency and intergenerational poverty are, to borrow a phrase, the dark satanic mills of the 21st century. And so I think we've been hugely privileged to hear from two great men this evening. John Howard and Duncan Smith, thank you for adding luster to our centre by your contributions this evening. Please join me in thanking them in the usual way.